Welcome to Badminton Unlimited, your weekly access to badminton action and beyond. This week, we catch up with one of the legends of the sport and the best player of his generation, Morton Frost. And we're in the mountainous nation of Nepal to report on the Pushpa Lal Memorial Ranking Badminton Championships and its contribution to the development of the game. Lee Chong Wei, Lin Dan, Yano Jorgensen, Chen Long. They are the men's singles players hitting the headlines in the present era. But back in the 80s, there was only one player who dominated in the world of badminton, Morten Frost. The Danish shuttler was the undisputed men's singles world number one for an incredible seven consecutive years. We are in Copenhagen to take a walk down memory lane with the badminton legend and also find out what's keeping the Great Dane busy these days. Well, here come the players for our first matches. I'm Jill Clark, delighted to say alongside me, as always, is the former world and number one, Morton Frost. How he got this one back, look at the cross. He's getting to that one as well. But this one here, and then cross. That takes legs. Never too far away from the sport he loves, nowadays, the 56-year-old is a familiar voice on television, calling the game from courtside. I'm telling you, it's, it's so difficult. Uh, I really find it very difficult. It's a, a major challenge for me, um, but uh, I do enjoy it. And I hope I, I just bring a little bit to the table and then people do enjoy what I'm saying now and again. My English is so, sometimes really struggling a lot because you, you sit there for five or six hours and you have to try to come up with new things and new ways of ex uh, expressions and saying it and sometimes you feel very limited. Frost might feel a little vulnerable when it comes to providing commentary for badminton, but in his playing days he was indomitable. The Danish great was known for his ability to adapt his play to his opponents. He was one of the few players who successfully combined the tactical singles game of his time with the more aggressive and physical style of today. I was caught in a, in a time in between, I think, uh, between the, 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 the real olden game and the new game of today. And I feel really lucky that I was able to develop my game to, to, to follow the Asians and to follow the, the new times and all that, so um, I, I feel very lucky on that. Otherwise, uh, simply just uh, playing to the best of my ability, using my, uh, my strength, what I was good at, uh, try to develop it even further. And uh, one day I was lucky enough to win a lot of tournaments. Morten Frost was the most decorated men's singles player of his generation. He's won practically every competition at the top level, most notably the All England Championship where he triumphed four times. However, the one major tournament that eluded Frost was the World Championships. The Dane came close, reaching the finals twice in 1985 and 87, but lost both times to China's finest, Han Jian and Yang Yang. For a man well known for his competitive edge, he's become more philosophical about this blemish over time. When I started playing it, the first time it was actually the first one in 1977. I participated in that, then the next in 80, 83. So you can see I had three tire chances in, in six years, which is not a lot. Today you have it every year. I just felt that, okay, I didn't win it this time, I win it next time. I didn't win it this time, I win it next time. But eventually there was no next time. Um, but on the other hand, I, I felt that, you know, I've been top of the world for so many years, I won so many tournaments, I've done my very best. Every stone was turned in order to try to win. Um, I couldn't really blame myself for anything, so, you know, you settle down, you're content, you say, that's perfectly okay. And Frost attributes some of his long standing at the top of the men's singles charts to his old friend and fiercest opponent, Prakash Padukone. He recalls fondly their rivalry on court and how training with India's legendary player helped him. 
we we had a we had a very good fight. He's a, <laughs> he's a very good friend of mine. We still stay in touch, and it's it's lovely to see him now and again. Um, I was very lucky. He he was very isolated in India at the time and needed uh, someone to practice with. He one day said, you know, I, I'm planning to move to Denmark here. Uh, would you be interested in training every day? And I thought, oh, fantastic, this is great. Um, and he came and he stayed here in Copenhagen for five years and uh, I owe him a lot. The everyday practice really, really helped me a lot. We practice together, you know, almost four to five times a week because uh, you know his focus his dedication his uh, uh, you know uh, willingness to work hard was more or less the same as mine so we had a lot of things in common playing with him helped me beat a lot of other chinese and indonesian players and also helped me uh, remain on the top for for a uh, much longer period frost called time on his playing days in 1991 and he continued on as a successful coach first the national coach of denmark where the team won gold at the 1996 atlanta olympics then he moved to coach Malaysia and then South Africa. When I stopped playing, I was 33 years old. It's obviously wrong what I'm saying, but in a way you feel your life is finished and what you love is finished. And I never thought that uh, that would come back. Coaching players has really been very, very rewarding and I never thought it would be. The way that you are able to work through other people and you laugh and cry with them. You have a common goal and when you achieve it, it's absolutely fantastic. But being part of it is great and I, I am I'm amazed how incredible that has felt for me as well. Whether as a coach or a player, Frost has risen to the challenge. His determination, discipline and positive outlook often brings him results. But above all, Morton Frost will always be remembered as one of the greatest badminton players of all time. We want you to tell us who this person is. I was born in Taiwan. I made my international debut in 2009. I won my first World Super Series title in 2012 at the Yonex Open Japan. We reveal all after the break. Mm. Zhongsang 可能最討厭還是自己做的不夠好的事情。We take you to Nepal when we return as the landlocked nation looks to boost the standing of its shuttles. Welcome back. Before the break, we asked you who this person was. I was born in Taiwan. I made my international debut in 2009. I won my first World Super Series title in 2012 at the Yonex Open Japan. The answer is Tai Suying. Tai was born in 1994 in Taiwan. The 20-year-old began playing badminton in elementary school and started playing for her country when she was just 15 years old. She became the first Taiwanese to win a World Super Series title in the singles event at the 2012 Yonex Open Japan and is currently ranked 9th in the BWF Women's Singles category.
Located in the Himalayas and home to the iconic Mount Everest, Nepal is a land steeped in spirituality and tradition. Nestled between China and India, it's a collision point of two of the biggest countries in the world. And with that comes traces of Nepal's sporting culture that mirrors its neighbors. Badminton is not new to the people of Nepal, dating back to 1951, where the first national team was formed. Ease of access to the sport has made badminton popular across the generations. When Badminton Unlimited dropped by Kathmandu, the nation's capital recently, a four-day national tournament was taking place. The Pushpa Lal Memorial Ranking Badminton Championships is one of the three most important national tournaments in the country next to the National Championships and Krishna Mohan Memorial Open National Badminton Championships. In its fourth installment since its inception in 2010, the tournament attracted a total of 250 participants. We have in Nepal Badminton. Nepal Badminton Association has its own ranking system. And from that ranking system, we picked the men's top 16 and those top 16 will play in this tournament. For the women, the top 8 play in this tournament. And as for the other events, it is open. Anybody can play. All events are open. Everybody can play. Besides the senior men's and women's events, the tournament featured various junior and veteran teams. The Nepal national team, which was preparing for the 2014 Asian Games, also took part in this annual tournament. It is a national ranking competition and it is very important for us national players. In this tournament, we get the opportunity to show our game and compete with players of various rankings. That is how we get the experience. On top of that, we also get some financial support. The Nepali badminton teams are regulars in the South Asian Games, an eight-member event comprising countries from India to Sri Lanka and Maldives. The men's and women's teams have clinched bronze medals in several of the earlier editions of the competition. But the lack of facilities and financial backing have made it difficult for Nepal to compete with the more illustrious names in the sport. In Asian standard, Nepal standard is not good. In the Asia context, Nepal's standard is not very good. If you want to compete with Asia's top level, we have to train very hard. It is also very important that government supports badminton. For the Nepal Badminton Association, we don't have our own covered halls. The covered halls are privately owned. They have their own members and our national team can't play there regularly. If the Nepal Badminton Association had their own covered halls from morning to evening, we could train whenever we wanted. Even for a tournament as important as the Pushpa Lao Memorial Ranking Badminton Championships, the hall with the only fully covered courts had to be rented from the National Sports Council. In addition, the association faces major financial restrictions. Sponsorship has been hard to find, often leaving a shortfall in funds. This all, uh, it is all supported by the corporations. Organizing a tournament is very difficult. To organize a tournament such as this, we have to spend more than 1.5 million rupees. That's 15,000 US dollars. It's a lot of money. We had hoped the government would have been able to support us by at least 50% of our budget. Then it would have been easier to organize this tournament. But the government is not supporting us by that much. They only support us 10%. Despite these resource shortages, players have shown a dedication to the sport that bodes well. We were selected and given assistance by the Nepal Badminton Association for this national rankings competition. Our local association was able to collect donations for us and that helped us to get here. Nepal, with an area of 141,000 square kilometres, is divided into 75 districts. 
There are governing bodies in 41 districts to help promote the sport. These district federations are working hand-in-hand -hand with Nepal Badminton Association to bring badminton down to the grassroots. The association has laid out plans for the coming months to not only introduce the sport to the young, but to also train the right people to raise the standard of badminton in Nepal. In October, we are having one... In October, we will be launching Shuttle Time. This Badminton Asian Confederation program tries to introduce badminton to school children. We are hoping to get more than a thousand players during this time. The Nepal Association is launching this program as well as the International Solidarity Course. This is for the training of coaches to try to make them better. This will be starting in December. That training we are having in December. Nepal may be a long way from the elites of the badminton world, but they have shown resilience and desire to overcome the obstacles they face. With these fighting qualities and boundless ambition, who can say what they can achieve? We are capable of winning international medals. Unfortunately, we don't have enough coaches or covered halls. The facilities leak during monsoon and we are unable to train. The standard of badminton would rise if we have enough coaches and training halls for us. When we return, we catch up with India's former national champion who is trying to return to his best, Anup Sridhar. Let's take a look at the BWF World Rankings. This week, we focus on the mixed doubles. In top spot, as they have been a while, our current Olympic and world champions Chang Nan and Chao Yun Lei. Danes Joachim Fischer Nielsen and Christina Pedersen follow in second. While China's Xu Chen and Ma Jin lie in third. England's couple Chris and Gabrielle Adcock are fifth. South Korea's Ko Song Hyun and Kim Ha Na are sixth. And rounding up the top ten is Singapore's Dani Bawa Krishnanta and Vanessa Neo. The BWF World Rankings are updated every Thursday, so don't forget to log on to www.bwfbadminton.org for all your latest information. For a country whose national pastime is cricket, the steady progress of Indian players in the world of badminton has been encouraging in the last few years. In the women's singles, Saina Newal and PV Sindhu have made an impact on the top of the sport, while the men's boasts the 2013 Thailand Open winner Kidambi Srikanth and gold medalist at this year's Commonwealth Games Kashya Parupali. Whilst these are, for the most part, some of the best moments of their career, there is one former national champion who is trying to return to his best, Anup Sridhar. The 31-year-old's career has been blighted since an injury in 2008, but this year has seen the India Thomas Cup captain return to some kind of form. I started 2014 really well. I had a couple of very good results. I got back into the core group. I got back into the, the Indian team. And I was also in the Indian team for the Thomas Cup in May. Uh, these things were such a big boost to me. Our cameras were in one of India's largest cities, Bangalore, when we caught up with the resurgent shuttler. As a proud native of the city, he was adding his support to the launch of Active Bengaluru, a local youth campaign for a healthy lifestyle. Anup's talent with the racket was also honed at the city's premier badminton academy, headed by one of the country's sporting legends, Prakash Padukone. But like most kids in India, the young Anup was more interested in the exploits of cricket heroes rather than the extraordinary achievements of Padukone. I didn't know actually of his achievements so much and I uh, wasn't very aware of it. I was of course very aware of uh, our cricket team's uh, achievements at the time but not so much badminton. So I was around 11 and a half when I got selected in the academy and I pretty much uh, stayed with the academy until uh, about two and a half years ago which is 
a really long time. It is about 17 plus years that I was with the academy. In those formative years, under the guidance of Padukone and his coaching staff, Anup made huge progress, winning the first of his three consecutive national titles in 2004. Yet on the international scene, success continued to elude him. A training stint in Denmark the following year proved to be the breakthrough he and his coaches were looking for. The experience shaped him both on and off the court. I think it uh, really sort of, uh, uh, you know, started my, my career, I think, as an international player because until then, I was the national champion in India, of course, but I didn't have any, uh, you know, big international result until then. Uh, once I went there and I adapted to their style of badminton and, and figured out how to be independent, it, it made all the difference. Uh, in fact, the next year itself, I, I broke into uh, the top 30 in the world and, and had all my good results. 2007 proved to be Anup's most successful year. He reached the semi-finals of both the German Open and the Asia Badminton Championships. But perhaps his highlight of the season was defeating the then men's singles reigning Olympic champion Taufik Hidayat at the World Championships held in Malaysia. Confidence was at its all-time high for the Bangalore native. I went into that match knowing I was going to win it. I know how ridiculous that may sound, but I, I don't know how to, to say it any other way. I just went into that match knowing I was going to win it. It ended up being extremely close, but uh, I still somehow believed I was going to win it, no matter what the score is. Anup star was on the rise. He was selected for the 2008 Beijing Olympics. However, 10 days before he was due to leave for the Chinese capital, Anup ruptured the ligament in his right ankle during training. Missing the biggest global sporting event wasn't an option for the shuttler as he boarded the plane anyway. Playing through the pain, Anu somehow managed to win his first match before bowing out of the competition. While the experience was memorable, he wished the circumstances had been different. At the time, I was, I was so disappointed and I was so crushed uh, coming back from, from, from there. You know, I mean, you go to an event like that wanting to do your best ever and to not be able to do that because my, I had broken two ligaments in my ankle, I was, I was just so disappointed. Just representing India at sort of the biggest sporting event uh, in the world was uh, an unbelievable feeling. You know, it was just uh, Saina and me who had qualified for the Beijing Olympics and to be the only male representative from badminton, again, it's, it's, it's a huge honor. Recognizing his outstanding achievements, India's top brass nominated Anup to be badminton's recipient for the prestigious Arjuna Award when he came back. Eager to get back to action, he has admitted that he mismanaged his rehabilitation. This, coupled with a strenuous playing schedule, meant he never really fully recovered from his injury. This has had a disastrous effect on his attempts to return to the top of his game and ultimately damaged his career. Unable to find any consistency, he plummeted from his highest world ranking of 24 to 60. Five tough years on, Anup is now hoping to push on after winning the Czech international title last year. Back in shape with lots to prove, the Olympian is raring to make up for lost time. Honestly, the, the thing that drives me now is, is just the fact that, that I still believe I, I have more to, to achieve. And, uh, the day I stop feeling that is the day I stop playing badminton. Anup is an inspiration to those who keep their dreams alive, no matter how difficult the road may be. As India strives to be among the world's best, their fans can rest assured that Anup Sridhar is more motivated than ever and will do anything he can to help his country in its quest. Before we go, let's find out what's happening on the international circuit with our Badminton Unlimited calendar. Next week on Badminton Unlimited, we sit down with one of the best doubles players of his generation, Indonesia's Christian Hadinata.
And we're in the Philippines to find out about Kenevic and Kenny Asuncion and how their achievements reignited the passion for badminton in the country.